NASA probably would have never launched 90-year-old Will Shatner. They would have seen it as a stunt. And you look at the media attention that got. Right. Uh, so there's a certain sort of cultural... But, you media. know, NASA probably shouldn't have launched William Shatner. Y you know, I mean, would you want your tax dollars going to that? This is Star Talk, Cosmic Queries Edition. Always popular with our audience. And today we're going to talk about the future of space, public versus private space missions. Oh. Everybody's thinking and talking about this subject. Chuck, have you been in any conversation where they heard you were related to Star Talk and this did not come up? Um, yes. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, people are very much, I mean, it's. Maybe that's a good thing, though. That's the one good thing about it. It's a buzz. Yeah. What, what, no matter where, where people land in the right. issues, there, it's a topic of conversation, which is something we haven't really been talking about space lately. I mean, right? There was, you know, yeah. there's been these lulls in it. Well, we've got on the show today so, someone who is perhaps the most pedigreed person in the world to talk on this subject. Oh, wow. my God. An old friend and coworker, Lori Garver. Lori, welcome to Star Talk. Thank you. It is wonderful to be here. Uh, and you have a, a you know an arm's length resume, and every item on that resume is space related. The one we have here, just because we're being lazy, is that you're a former deputy administrator to NASA, appointed by Obama. So the deputy administrator is the second highest ranking person at NASA, if I remember the 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 org chart. And you're the recent author of Escaping Gravity, mm. My Quest to Transform NASA and Launch a New Space Agency. I see what you did there with the yeah, word there's launch. Yeah, there's a lot. Mm. <laughs> now, uh, disclosure here, I actually blurbed the book. Oh. Okay, so if you look somewhere on the cover or inside, uh, the, so I'm going to read you my blurb. So here it is. Former NASA official, Lori Garver, offers a front row seat to the decades long struggle within and among space bureaucrats and space billionaires. Bring popcorn as you bear witness to an untold slice of space history. Neil deGrasse Tyson, American Museum of Natural History. Because that, I read that book, it was like, where's the popcorn? Oh my gosh, oh wow. my gosh. So Lori, Lori, Lori. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you've 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 done tours of duty in government, in industry, in you've you you've seen sides of this, more sides of this of this multi-dimensional space than most people have. How do you d does this make enemies with everybody or friends with everybody? Like do the bureaucrats see you as a industry person? Do the industry people see you as a bureaucrat? Do the academics see you as a kiss up to the who do you have any friends at all left? <laughs> yeah, you know, I have a dog. I okay. live in Washington, so that's probably... <laughs> that's one friend. You got one friend. Okay. Um, so goes the old saying. The, the, my, the dog is proud of you every day, no matter what you did that day. Yes. Exactly. Be who your dog thinks you are. That's, yes. That's my motto. Um, you, you nailed it. I've got people who see what, from their corner, view my perspective as not quite in their corner because I think my view and the point of, of the book, thank you for your blurb and introduction, is that I, I brought a different perspective to my two tours at NASA. I've been there over 10 years, twice for about five years each, ran the policy office in the Clinton administration in the 90s. And we have always been going to be on this path, you know, of launching a new space age. Uh, people have been talking about it for decades. It didn't just start with Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, but because of them, we are talking about it more. And for a lot of reasons that I'm sure we will talk about today, we have um, a lot of people questioning why we're doing it a certain way. Is this the best way? Why isn't it just NASA anymore? Why aren't we back on the moon? And why aren't we on Mars? Mm. Many, many yeah. questions. Plus, yeah. if you go if you go private, sort of independent space industry, the huge space industrial complex uh, probably feels threatened at some level. Is that is that a fair comment? 
Mm-hmm. That's the real rub, I think, is that aerospace managed to, late 50s, early 60s, transform their uh, the equipment and weapons they used into civil space programs. And it's those very contractors who have been working for NASA, contracting with the space agency ever since and doing wonderful things, but doing it on contract where you got paid the usual large amount, whether you delivered or not, year after Mm. year. And they didn't want to let that go, obviously. The glamour of launching astronauts um, is a wonderful thing for them, especially because they were also getting billions to do it. If you calculate about $350 billion that we've spent on human spaceflight since Apollo, we've launched about 350 people. So they've been getting a lot of money to launch astronauts and to be able to market themselves as that kind of company and not just a weapons building company. So they did not wait, wait, we just want by to do it. this. Wait, wait, wait. I know. Stop. That, we just, we just slipped by I'm a not fast an astrophysicist, but that math kind of sounds like a billion dollars a person. <laughs> yeah. I, I Don't just slide by that, Lori. So we're talking nearly a billion dollars if you, if you, amer- if you average that out a billion dollars per human being launched into space since Apollo. That NASA has done. That has nothing to do with these private individuals. Right, no, but that's space. a number just to yeah. like, just to dangling there yeah. in front of us it's, all. It's in the book. It's hard to, you know, just like with a shuttle, we can say, oh, there's marginal costs, there's all this. But the bottom line, NASA, not the whole budget, NASA's human spaceflight budget. Okay, so for those people less... Uh, less economic one-on-one fluent the marginal cost is the incremental cost not including the startup costs and the capital costs that made the thing happen in the first place correct right so, and so, i'm including those in the billion we're just putting it all in there so a lot it, of people will consider that an unfair number because they want to use the marginal cost which is vastly yeah. lower but you have to set the thing up in the first place right right yeah. however in all fairness to what people might consider bloat that is the purpose of a government um, involvement in anything that large. Wait, wait, Chuck, that, did I just hear you say, in all fairness, to bloat? Did, did, yeah. Did I, was that in that sentence? That, I know, because <laughs> I know that people often give say- Give bloat a fairness. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, okay. because yeah, the people say- we're saying is give bloat a chance. Give bloat That's a chance, you, man. <laughs> like, you know, so bloat on, bloat, bloat on. No, but my, my point is that People think that the government wastes money, right? And that anything that government is involved in is a waste of money because the government is doing it. There's a whole whole set of people think that way. There's a whole set of people that just think that. And so, but my, but what I'm saying is there are certain things that the government has to do because the money, there is no money in it. So it's all waste. It's all waste. If, if it were private, listen, so look at me, like, li- listen to me right now. Just follow me here. If you were in 1960 trying to go to the moon as General Electric, that is a complete waste of money. 100% waste. There is nothing in it for you as a company. There's no profit. No, share, no shareholder. There's no right. shareholder. There's no benefit at all. Okay. It's 100% wasted money. So when you think of like the government wasting money, there are many benefits that we got from going to the moon. It turned out not to be a waste of money. But if you were a corporate CEO, that's a total waste of money. Okay, Chuck, that is the first time I've ever heard someone defend bloat. Just want to put that out there. <laughs> but, but, but second- It's 100%, a, an excellent point. We don't want people to think what NASA is doing should be done by the private sector. The, the real difference here is NASA, the government, should be driving technologies and doing new and exciting things. Neil talks about this all the time, like going to the moon. Since then, perhaps, Doing the shuttle program, which was supposed to reduce the cost of taking people and stuff to and from space, it didn't reduce the cost. And uh, so that is what we're talking ooh. about post-Apollo. Yeah, very good okay. point. Yeah, okay, good so point. it's it's the bureaucracy. It's like the right stuff, Form 3612B. <laughs> like- <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the point is the... Um, once we realized that the reusable space shuttle did not actually make things cheaper. In fact, Lori, correct me if I'm wrong. 
Even the Air Force bailed out of the space shuttle as a launch system for for s secure uh, satellites and other activities because it was too costly, and they would just launch it themselves for less. Uh, do I remember that correctly? Well, NASA had uh, argued successfully that all the defense military satellites should be on the shuttle, yes, in the beginning. But after Challenger, which, you know, was our 25th flight, a new policy said the Defense Department military payloads go elsewhere. You know, yeah, they had to okay. sit around for years because they were waiting on the shuttle. Right, but right. the government was trying, it, you know, to amortize. Um, to, to the credit, you know, and, to the credit, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and they ended up really limiting the shuttle's payloads after that to only those missions that required the space shuttle itself. And, and the so, volume, the volume in the payload section, right. Well, right. you couldn't just launch satellites with the volume of the payload because you were risking astronaut lives at that point. So right. it was only those those things afterwards that they there were plenty in the queue who that, that had already made themselves uniquely capable with with the shuttle so they didn't move off but for the most part we built the space station with a space shuttle after that yeah yeah and so one last thing before we get to our our uh, patreon questions uh, Lori, uh what do, what of the point you know one of the, the the clarion calls when someone says uh you know the government spent you know x billions of dollars on this and where does it gotten us and private enterprise should do it one of the re rebuttals is the money is not in space the money is spent on earth and there's thousands of engineers and scientists who are paid to do this work from that money on earth that contribute to their economies and the real estate and their schools and so uh, what do you view how do you view that as a as a legit comeback to that kind of attack you know i think when we are spending the public's money we should always be aware of what is the purpose and nasa's purpose ha helps us to improve the economy, our national security, and it is an inspiration for people to study math and science. Those were the original, uh, I call them fear, greed, and glory. You have a different take slightly on that, but that's why we do it. So to the extent we are going about exploring space like we did in Apollo and in the early days with new technologies, the return on that government investment, the return on those jobs, is a multiplier. What is the problem is when the government starts just paying us to do stuff we've already done, and A, that competes with the private sector, and B, it isn't a multiplier because you're not incentivizing sort a of that or something that, yeah, is gonna right, have a bigger right. a bigger market. The launch industry that we privatized is, was so obviously ripe for this because we weren't launching any satellites anymore commercially because we had priced ourselves out with a shuttle and the U.S. rockets were being run by a monopoly, United Launch Alliance. So we really have now come back against China, Russia, and the French who were launching all the satellites and now that's huge for our economy. So those those investments were job multipliers. Wait, so Lori, here's an interesting uh, dimension here. Throughout all of Gemini, Apollo, uh, you know, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, we have contracted with the space industrial complex, but their names are not on any of the vessels. Okay, you didn't see Lockheed Martin, Boeing, they're not on any of the vessels. So it looked like we, did, NASA just did it all themselves, but that wasn't the case. Whereas now with pure private industry, it says SpaceX going up. No, no bow to doubt it, right? So, um, is there any reason for that shift? Yes, the it, it is fascinating to me that the companies themselves who have been building this stuff for years, they didn't get their names on them, and I don't know if they ever asked, but they do advertise uh, with those programs constantly. And so you'll see their logo tied in with the programs. But what the difference is now, primarily with SpaceX, is they are putting their own skin in the game that when they've got a program the way NASA is now contracting, SpaceX sort of owns it and NASA is just buying a service. So when I was at NASA in around 2012, they were launching to the space station for the first time. SpaceX asked if they could put NASA's name on the rocket. Oh, wow. wow. Guess, guess what NASA said? No. No. Not our rocket. 
Wow. And poor Gwen Shotwell, she, was, she is still the president, called. I, I thought I could break that free, but the head of NASA wasn't interested in doing that. The lawyers gave him some, you know, uh, it's not a rocket. Well, I was shocked when, for a commercial crew, they come out, not only is the rocket filled with logos of NASA and SpaceX, but they drove out there in Tesla cars. Yes. I mean, <laughs> I, I, the, the fact that NASA has embraced this program, um, who, who initially one of their arguments for not doing it was the public won't pay attention if it's not NASA. I mean, we just couldn't have gotten it more wrong in some way. Yeah, but yeah, but they're yeah. doing a good job, uh, I guess. I mean, it's a little... It's it's more than even I would have probably done. Yeah, right. and, and I I think it's funny because when you say the public won't pay attention because it's not if it's not NASA, it's like there's one car service that takes people to the theater or the movie or a concert, and everybody thinks that people are actually concerned about the car service. You yeah. know, it's, yeah. it's like, no, the car service only takes you to the main show. Space is the main show. <laughs> yeah. Space yeah, good is point. the show. <laughs> it's what, yeah, what are you doing in space and who are you launching? Right. right. Na NASA probably would have never launched 90-year-old Will Shatner. They would have seen it as a stunt. And you look at the media attention that got. Right. Uh, so there's a certain sort of cultural. But you know, NASA probably shouldn't have launched William Shatner. You, you know, I mean, would you want your tax dollars going to that? I, I don't, don't know. Think so. I, I mean, don't think so. I, we, we owe I'm him something. thrilled that he got to go. We owe him something, I think. Ooh, yeah. I'm thrilled that and, he and got the to go. And the comedians owe him something because you all imitate him all the time. Well, that's what I was going to say. It's just <laughs> but like, what was fascinating your is tax when... dollars at work. <laughs> <laughs> you all get 10% he... of every gig that you did, did it in. You know. <laughs> when he returned, he was more eloquent than anyone I've I've ever heard. He was clearly I, moved by the experience. Yes. I will say that you're right about that. Um, my, I will say my favorite memory of all of these launches was seeing him step off of the the, the vessel and talk about the emotional yeah. Yeah. connection that he now had to you know what just happened. And just for what it's worth. Uh, astronauts, at least historically, were not selected based on how emotional they are. <laughs> Dude, this is amazing! I can't believe what I'm seeing! Oh, oh my god. god, what is that red light? What's uh, that red light? Hello? Oh, we're gonna Hello? die? Oh my god, we're gonna die! <laughs> it was the George Costanza rule. That was the opposite. They wanted to be cool. Houston, we have a problem. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, Lori, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to hit our Patreon questions. Who, that, they're raring to go here. And, Chuck, you got the list? I do. All right. All right. When we come back, more with a friend and 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 longtime co-worker when I was sort of had a lot of overlap with the space um, industry and with NASA itself, Lori Garver. We'll be right back. We're back. Star Talk Cosmic Queries edition. And this one is all about the transition of NASA and just the world in its acceptance of commercial space relative to space programs. So it's civil space, I guess that was called. And so, Lori, uh, you've just written a book. And I happen to know this book was going to have a different title. Well, what title did you originally propose it as? Well, I proposed it originally as Billionaires and Bureaucrats the race to save NASA. Uh, the publishers changed it to Space Pirates, which is how I refer to the community of people in the space movement. We like to think we have a movement. I'm not sure we do, but we like to. And um, they eventually changed it to Escaping Gravity. Which is also a pleasant title. I have no yeah. problem with that. Yeah. Yeah. It was just not uniquely that book, because any book on space can yeah, say Yeah, I, I, had, I had to reformat it a bit, but I liked it too. They did their their research on it, and that's what they came up with. I think Billionaires and Bureaucrats was very early on, you know, although I've been involved in a lot of different aspects of NASA, as you said, that has tended to be the flashpoint in my career. Yeah, I was good. a bureaucrat, and I was supporting doing this uh, with the billionaires. I right, actually right. think you need both. So the answer is very clear. It's not a versus. 
It's just to be clear, I, I, I think you need one a little bit more than the other. <laughs> I'm just gonna say, <laughs> well, I, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just. I know I'm. Def, I know I'm somebody who just defended bloat, and I'm about to defend bureaucrats. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, billionaires don't add uh, to the public good as much as bureaucrats do. I mean, as much as good bureaucrats, but you need the money at some point. So right. Oh yeah, you're right. Okay. But you know what's funny is we say bureaucrats, but what I call them are. Um, career government officials. Yeah, but Chuck, you have never heard bureaucrat in a sentence that was positive. That's my point. (laughs) (laughs) But then you look at people like, let's just say, take for instance, a solicitor general. That's a bureaucrat, but that's somebody who has a very important um, position in the government. You know, he's not- Yes, Chuck, but no one will call him a bureaucrat because the bureaucrat is an insult. But oh, it shouldn't right. be. I don't think it should be either. I, I think, agree. I'm just yeah, telling you, like, yeah. don't don't shoot the messenger well, here. I think we. Yeah. My point is, I do think Neil and I would agree with, with Chuck in that this is really um, good people for the most part. Yes, yes. Doing work on behalf of the public, and NASA is one of those great agencies doing that. Now, did right. I talk about and book some of the individuals and things going on that shouldn't be. Yes. And that's partly because I believe it's such an important thing that we need to be doing as government. And when we can't share with the public that what we're doing is all above board and efficient, we have problems. And so I think billionaires weren't were not even part of what we were thinking of in the 1990s when we were looking right. to more involved private sector and launching rockets. Right. Uh, we didn't have people worth the amount of billions that we do now, and it was not even a consideration. Lockheed Martin won the first effort to privatize sort of the post-shuttle space transportation. It didn't end up working for technical reasons, probably some business reasons as well, because we had at that point the constellations of satellites that were predicted to be launching uh ended up being hopefully, well, now delayed rather than canceled by the bursting of the dot-com bubble. Back at the t- in, in the day, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Forgot about that dot-com. I know, right, right, See, right. See, there yeah. were companies trying to do exactly what SpaceX uh, and Blue Origin and Virgin ended up doing in the 90s, but they lost their shirts because they didn't end up having stuff to launch. Well, this is, yeah. this is Elon Musk's famous quote, uh, how do you make a small fortune in the space industry? Start with a large fortune. <laughs> uh, <that's laughs> yeah. So, Lori, the book uh, is out now. People can buy it at a at a your favorite uh, book outlet, whatever that might be. And Chuck, you got questions for us? Yes, we do. Let's let's jump right into it. Here we go. This is Lucas Charleston. He says, "Do you think of private companies do go into space exploration?" Will it prompt competition that will speed up technologies that will cause more companies to go into space exploration? (laughs) Yes. Uh, And where would their funding come from? Now, there's the rub. That's the rub. See, I don't. There's the rub. I might disagree with Lori on this, but I want to hear your your answer first. I think it is already happening. Um, I think the earlier companies that did this drove technologies that have made their their way into other um, either parts of the satellites to reduce the cost and the mass, because a lot of this is about launching smaller things cost less. Um, And now that that capability is expanding, although a lot of these are protected IP rights you do end up having more and more companies. I think there's over a hundred startup launch companies right now. They are not all going to make it, but they are all adding their own unique innovation. And the people who are doing it were trained from, you know, working for the previous companies. Yeah, and and IP is intellectual property, right? Yeah. As you use that abbreviation. So what you're saying there, I hadn't really thought about this. The total number of startup companies, you only exist as a startup, because you're coming to the table with something nobody else has, some niche that you hope grows to become large. But the fact that you're at the table at all, the sum of the startup companies represents a remarkable moving frontier of science and technology. Is that a fair statement? Yes, and much of that does make its way into consumer products. These are things that really, as a 
virtuous cycle. What, what used to be, um, it cost so much because everything was so expensive that ended up being its own negative feedback cycle. But now you're seeing people, oh, well, it doesn't cost that much to launch, so I can try this out. Yeah, um, yeah. And then things work. And then they're going to, oh, well, maybe we could refuel on orbit. Maybe we could do these other things, things that have been on NASA's plate for a long time. But frankly, NASA became a little calcified and risk, uh, you know, scared of risk, mainly because the political establishment in Congress and some administrations didn't want to see anything fail. More of your frenemies scattered around the government. So, so but, I, but getting back to that other important point of that question, and this is where we might part ways, Lori. Uh, people use the word exploration as though anyone going into space is exploring. But when I think of exploration, I think advancing a space frontier, going farther onto objects that have never been previously explored. Explored, and I do not see a business model for that. And so I see NASA as, this, as a uniquely capable of posing questions and answering questions that would later on then hand it over to industry once they figure out the sources of risk for and it. And I have agreed with you on this point for a long time. The only difference being these billionaires, they are out there. They don't have to satisfy a shareholder. Mm. Uh, they, they can just do it. And once they have the real question to what you said is at what price point is yeah. there not a market? And if they can do something that lowers that price point enough that then it does make sense, there there might be more business cases. But I I don't see many beyond tourism at this point. Right. Got it. Got okay. it. All right, Jack, keep going. Oh, that brings us to that. What a perfect segue to Avnish Yoshi or Joshi, who says this. Hello, Dr. Tyson and Deputy Garber. I'm Avnish. I'm 11 years old. I heard about an asteroid in the asteroid belt called 16 Psych. I also heard there was a mission being sent out with the objective to mine that asteroid and to make sure that it was a planet core. First of all, is this true? Secondly, when will that happen? And third, what technology will we use? Also, dovetailing onto what you guys just said, will NASA continue to do this kind of research when commercial organizations take over space exploration. Wait, Chuck, did the child did, is how, how did old the is the 11-year-old really say that? <laughs> this is how okay, so now, and, and he says, I'm, uh, I'm from, I'm Avnish uh, from Houston, Texas. And then uh, it says, this totally was not written by his father. Um, <laughs> but also, I was gonna, at NASA, yeah. I, I was gonna say, who. Uh, what's he got going in his basement? But in, in Houston, they don't have basements. So it'd have to be in his garage That's to see what right. he's working on that nobody knows okay. about. Well, asteroids and the Psyche mission, those are, and, and the overall question is so important. And I would say- and By the way, it's named after the the uh, Greek uh, mythological character, Psyche. So right. it's, you, you pronounce the E at the end, like Penelope, Psyche. Yeah, right. it's okay. not Psyche. Nah, I was psych. about to say, psych. <laughs> <laughs> so that asteroid, if I remember correctly, represents a planet that had mostly formed and it was broken apart. But if you have a mostly formed planet, all the heavy stuff falls to the middle and the lighter stuff floats to the top. We have an explainer um, uh, video on that. Uh, and so if what what is heavy that would fall to the middle? Uh, palladium, gold, silver, platinum, iron, Cha-ching, baby, oh, cha except for the iron, except for the iron. <laughs> Cha-ching, cha yeah. So you would hand pick your asteroids that have been pre-sifted to be rich in these elements that you might care about more than other elements. Now, Lori, go for it. Yeah, that is a great background for my, my points about the value of not just the Psyche mission, but the asteroid search is Asteroids for three primary reasons are areas that we as humanity care about. One is what Neil just talked about, and this is a particularly, um, hopefully rich asteroid. And for any kind of future space development, people feel we will need to use the resources of asteroids, probably never gonna you know, mine the gold and send it back. It's never gonna 
get cheap enough to do that, that it's worth it. But utilizing those for space development, those materials is really important for a future. And just to be um, clear, that's how the movie Don't Look Up ended. Okay, someone came in and said, don't blow this out of the sky. Let's mine it for, Let's its, mine resources. It for its resources. And, yeah. and then by the way, that guy was a billionaire in the movie. <laughs> the in the second, yes, he was. God, what a <laughs> hilariously silly movie. But the um, the second reason there, okay, they can hit us. Obviously, this is something that we have run this experiment. People know the dinosaurs didn't make it because they didn't have a space program. Um, NASA has a role. I won't say they're the lead role because there's a lot of questions about that, but diverting a potential uh, planet hurting or killing asteroid is something that we need to care about. So we need to understand asteroids better, track them to see when they're coming and figure out ways to move them if needed. Well, and just, the just, third, to add to, wait, just to add to Lori's point, it's not to, you know, to understand an asteroid. This isn't a psychological session. Tell me about yourself, asteroid. Mm. It's that physically, many asteroids, we do not know what's holding them together. And are they piles of rock? Are they solid? Are the two pieces stuck together? And so if you should go up and try to push it, you want to know full well in advance how it's going to respond to how you touch it. Otherwise, your whole mission could fail. So when Lori says casually, yes, we want to understand the asteroid, it is... Uh, there's a lot behind that word. A lot of meaning there. Yeah, I like I like the 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 more understood meaning better. It's just you know. How do you feel? Exactly. <laughs> cold? Are you cold? I am trying my best to hold it together. But what do you have against Earth? Why are you headed towards Earth? <laughs> so the third is we, yeah. we believe that life uh, very likely transport transferred here in a comet or asteroid. So they may have the seeds to life. So comets and asteroids are incredibly important. And therefore, to the point of the um, question, we need to be studying them. And the government, in my view, has an important role in yeah. doing that. Yeah. Now, to the extent the private sector should, this is a, the perfect way you could transition. The government does a mission like Psyche. We're able a to first mission. A first mission, yeah, yeah. First mission, able to characterize the asteroid able to help determine ways that it could potentially be moved and how when we see the signature of asteroids uh, coming toward us, what that might mean. They look like close up. There's a lot of science that will go into this. But when we have that information, you can imagine certain industries having more interest in going to the asteroids in the future that have heavy metals and the things that they'll want to study. We're going to take a quick, quick break. Uh, and Lori, when we come back, why don't you start off telling us about uh, Space Resources? Is that what they're called? There's a startup uh, company or organization that wants to be the first to mine asteroids. So when, when Star Talk Cosmic Queries continues, nice little bit of alliteration there. We've got Lori Garver, old time friend and space professional, when we come back. Lori, we left off with a question from an 11-year-old who lives in Texas, so he doesn't really have a basement, probably. So I wonder if his parents know what he's making in the garage. Okay. Is he... uh, he's got a cloaking device in the garage. <laughs> so... so you can't, they couldn't know even they, if they They have there. no idea. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, Lori, this notion that we would, uh, NASA would have a mission to the asteroid Psyche which would be rich in the kind of materials that would sink to the middle of a planet. And this is an asteroid left over from a shattered planet. Uh, what uh, I heard that there's some companies today that have prioritized mining asteroids for just that purpose. Um, can you comment on any of them? Sure. You know, there have been companies looking at this for decades and mining the moon is probably a first uh, order uh, it's an easy target. That, yeah, yeah, very that good. That the government is going to start with the whole reason we haven't talked about Artemis yet, but the whole reason to send people back to the moon this time is to land at the South Pole near where you could mine resources, namely water that might be trapped in the ice in the shaded parts of the South Pole of the moon. Those Let me just explain to Chuck there are places in the South Pole where the rim of the crater permanently prevents sun from reaching the crater because the sun doesn't get very high in the sky. Okay. Okay. So literally 
we're looking for water where the sun don't shine. To uh, you, you know, that just does not sound the kind. It's certainly not potable. <laughs> certainly not potable. That's all I'm saying. Well, those astronauts drink their own urine, so I'm pretty sure that. You know, I'm about that. <laughs> okay. And, and, and like sweat, right? And the moisture that that they evaporates from their skin. Yeah, it's pretty wow, nasty. Very doomed. It's very, it's very, very doomed. Well, we're going to all be there. So these are technologies that we might want to see be uh, yeah. perfected. It's all doomed. Okay, so go on, Lori, interrupted. Uh, so mining asteroids, mining the moon, is something that companies are starting to look at seriously. And I, I think the business plans will be long-term. I think the technologies will be driven by the government. Another great example of how this sort of hand-in-glove um can, situation can help us advance space development and potentially exploration and if you're good at getting around asteroids you know tell the mining company oh by the way that one of those is headed towards us could you deflect it over to the left a little they'll probably have the ability and the resources to do that and i'm just waiting for the space force to step up and say that it's their job i've been up in their face about it ever since they were birthed so okay what's yeah. their reaction uh, nods. Uh, I don't think that was their original intent, right? They weren't thinking that way, but, but I, this was this an is, issue for uh, for us at NASA is we would have the expertise, but then the military and in that point mainly the Air Force would come in and say, "Oh, yeah, you know, we're the guardians of the galaxy." It's like, no, nah, well, <laughs> <laughs> the Air Force fully contained everything space in the Pentagon before we had the Space yes, Force. Yes. So that that's what you're saying there. Yeah. Okay, Chuck, give me another one. All right, here we go. And authorities keep it an eye on that kid. We don't want him to. It, please do. Next. Exactly. <laughs> what, what superhero I, nemesis is he going to be? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Avnish is uh, his, his. I'm puberty man. Like, you know, that's <laughs> is this that's where we're. Yeah, we got to look at exactly. what, what superhero doesn't have a nemesis yet. We'll, we'll line him up for that. Okay. So go on. Okay. Um, this is from Alexander Newhouse, who says. Um, uh, Deputy Garver, uh, what is the current state of space law as it Ooh. relates to public and private missions going to outer space? In fact, let me tighten that and say, what is the state of space law related to who owns what? All right. right. Do, do, do wow. I own the asteroid that I mine? Right. 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 If I pitch tent on Mars, do I own the, the acre of land around it? So where, where does all that sit right now? It is a work in progress that mm. one of the big challenges, and this is pretty typical throughout history, a technology advances to a point where, oh, we don't have the governance set up correctly to manage this. Right. Um, and that's really where we are in space. We started in the 60s with uh, the Outer Space Treaty, which said that celestial bodies cannot be privately owned. And by signing that, uh, the U.S. as a spacefaring nation is, did not claim the moon, you noticed, when we landed. Um, in spite of putting the flag there, which is what anyone does when <laughs> right. they're claiming something. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, listen, that, this is for us all. It's, yeah. like, it's like an Oscar. I'm accepting this on behalf of everyone who was nominated. Yes. I mean, I'm taking it home. <laughs> no, it's going to be on my mantle, not yours. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah, and, and those moon rocks in the not basement in Houston, Texas, and Johnson Space Center uh are, are everyone's, but just try to try to get a little piece of one you know, find out NASA. They're NASA's. Um, yeah, yeah. But we really have um, a lot of progress made. Space lawyers have been working on all kinds of activities. But in my mind, the big issue of rights claims is not settled. And one of the things the companies who want to go and do the mining of the asteroids want is to be able to claim if we can get there we it, it can be ours and we can make money off of it so that's a, a home that's a homesteading model homestead. basically yeah yeah and and the space pirates really believe this because that's sort of why i name them the space pirates they really believe that it should be people going out and doing this like the frontier in the united states um we had you know the ability to just have the you could work the land, you could own the land. Yeah, 1800s, and, 1800s United States was all about that, right. And yeah. that is the kind of thing they like to model um, in in outer space, but we are a long ways from that. 
Mm. I'm going to say a problematic historical period to uh, base any model on. Right. <laughs> To speak I, I was personally. going to know we aren't unaware of any native people out or right, even organisms right. out there, but that doesn't mean they're not there. And our history is replete with, yes, these yeah. not plus, so plus great NASA, lessons. I think, has all but completely removed the word colonization from their official oh, documents. I, I, I think frontier is even e even not that, there. yeah. No more. Yeah, not even yeah. frontier, huh? Right, right. Wow. right. Plus, well, it's, not probably. Called, it's not called manned space, it's called crude. C R E W. Well, and when you said, you know, everyone, we put our flag on the moon, we did it for all mankind. So that's why we've got well, Artemis. We have, that was early enough so that no one knew how to otherwise say it. I'm well, I was eight. <laughs> yeah. I didn't feel, I didn't feel the warmth. You didn't feel it? <laughs> okay. Nope. You weren't feeling just, it. Not till uh, Valentina. You weren't, you weren't feeling it. <laughs> yeah. That's great. <laughs> okay. Or tell Chuck who Valentina is because he doesn't know. First woman in space. Yeah, Valentina Russian. Tereshkova. Russian. Yeah. And it took the U.S. twenty years after her to to have our first Sally Ride. Wow. Ride Sally Ride was the headline. Yeah. First uh, small small text American woman in space. Right. Yeah. 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 It, rather than the headline, after twenty freaking years, we finally get uh, around right. to having a female astronaut. So Chuck, let's do a lightning round, okay? Um, how, many, how many can we knock it? Well, actually, it's not up to Chuck. It's up to Lori. Okay, Lori, we're going to oh, do a lightning round. Okay. okay. We'll, 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 we'll see how your sound bites work. Okay. okay actually, let's we go. didn't do too bad with these with the ones that we have. So Yeah, okay. Go. Uh, yeah. Um, here we go. Um, this is Chris Hampton. He says, hey, I'm currently 25 years old. Do you think that by the time I am in my 80s that I will be able to take a sightseeing trip to Jupiter or Saturn, or at least just see those planets as I go around them, even if it's a one-way trip. <laughs> Let me lead off by saying, that's why we invented telescopes. <laughs> yeah, how far away do you want to be? That was my question. <laughs> All right, so Laurie, uh, humans to the out beyond the asteroid belt, that's really what that question is. What do you think? Maybe. It would take leaps. You know, we always judge our near future. We think we can do more in it than than we can. But in the far future, we tend to misjudge for the opposite reason. Correct, correct. So I don't want to roll, I, would, I wouldn't roll it out, but he's, he's we don't 50, have the talking, technology today. He's talking 55 years in the future. Yeah, yeah. 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 Not today, we don't have the technology. Okay. Oh, no. let me so ask that, you both. That sounds what like a no. Biggest, what's the biggest impediment for uh, doing something like that? So human's ability to survive the radiation because our propulsive methods are slow. Right. Yeah. So it's a combination. So, so if you could go a lot faster, you might right. be able to survive. <laughs> right. Go, you get there and back and not get heavily irradiated. But plus you got to be ready to, you know, invest. You know, Saturn is twice as far away as Jupiter. So, you know, Jupiter is, is it a five-year trip, six years? And Saturn, are, we, are you ready to give up? that big a fraction of your life to see what you might be able to see through a telescope or better yet to see what a space an orbiting space probe will do we'll see Th those pictures from cassini really great Saturn? pictures yeah oh my gosh yeah so that's the uh, the real question is so why you know why, why would you want right. to and, right, right. and that's a big big question so nasa should sell picture frame windows with extra 8k video of their right. space missions and right. make people think that they're actually on this craft itself. I mean, listen, that would work. I mean, I see it as as a ride at Disney that's very popular. Yep. You know, but uh, you're right. Why? I, I mean, listen, I think it would be great to lay eyes on, you know, any part of Antarctica. OK, but guess what? I don't, I'm, I don't, I, you ain't unless, going. <laughs> unless I can walk, I'm not going. I'm not hey, going. So so now you're going to get me because I have done it and it was a little bit of a junket government blow situation, but I was checking out Antarctica as a government employee and I don't know. It's not the same if you're not there. Oh, you, you've got to be there. You're just making his point now. I, I totally am. You're but totally making his he's point. He's going to just look out a window and when, when the plane, the massive, you know, cargo plane lands at 12,000 feet on the pole because it's mountainous region, flat only because it's all filled in with glaciers. Okay, wait, just to be clear, Lori, that's not happening on any 
planet or any moon in the solar system. I know. He, he's not I disembarking know. from the spaceship. That's the difference. That is that's that, the yeah, difference. that's kind of an important but, difference here. Well, it would be the Chug, equivalent. But for Chug, uh, you get the chance to go to Antarctica. I, I wouldn't rule it out. Should do it. Okay. okay. All right. But wait, wait, uh, Lori, have you noticed his skin color? Okay. I was going to say, you. Are, I was just about to say, Lori, you will not find a frozen black man anywhere on this planet. <laughs> as, as they thought the caveman out of the glacier, that That's will not right. be a black you person. You did not find, there was not one caveman named Lamar, okay? <laughs> you ain't find no Daryl. No Daryl was in the cave, okay? <laughs> Fro- thawed out from the glacier and it consumed them. Exactly. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, no, 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 we're done here. We don't have any more time. Oh, we don't have um, time. Okay. Oh man, that's. Oh sad. man, that was super fun. Well, Lori, I don't know why we haven't had you on before because you would have I been. I don't a... either. Oh my, we, you had such a trove of insight. It's and... so interesting when when she asked me, their publisher, and I'm like, yeah, I don't think. I... Yeah, yeah. No, we. That's an oversight, and I'm embarrassed yeah. by that because that's okay. You, you were totally in the middle of all that as it was going down, and so now you could be like. Our, as they do on the news, their expert commentator who used to be in it and now right, they observe right. it and then comment yeah, like on it. like all those sports stars. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's maybe we'll have to connect you in that way going forward. But good luck with the book. Um, like I said, it's a front row seat. And please remind us of the name. Escaping Gravity. My quest to transform NASA and launch a new space age. Nice, which is precisely what we are in the middle of thanks to your help. In spite of all the enemies you made along the way. And Chuck, she's very candid about who became a friend and who became an enemy simply because of the worldviews that they carried forward. And that's a bit of candor you don't typically see. So a thanks for that gift. I'll call it a gift, Lori, of your life story to the rest of us. Uh, Lori, are you on social media? Yes, I am. How do we find you? Twitter, Lori underscore Garver. And Lori with an I, yes. Uh Yes, L-O-R-I underscore G-A-R-V-E-R. Same with Instagram. Okay, excellent. And Chuck, always there at Chuck Nice Comic. Yes, sir. Thank you. You got it. All right. This has been Star Talk Cosmic Queries Space Program Edition. Space Program Becoming Space Industry Edition. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, as always. Keep looking up. <laughs> <laughs>